Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, and I'm really pleased to be here and joined by Eleanor Goldfield, who is a creative radical, a journalist, and a filmmaker. She previously directed Hard Road of Hope, and she's also a board member of our friends over at the Media Freedom Foundation. And um, a lot of her work deals in promoting mutual aid and direct action as part of activism and she's here to discuss and present and get into a conversation about our new film which is called to the trees and uh, so i'll just put a little thing up here and uh, it's got some very gorgeous photography and uh i pulled this shot because i really like what you did there with okay. it the blend of color and black and white photography so uh there's a little bit of a, of a, of a look at this. It takes place in the Redwood Forest in California, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. But uh, welcome. Welcome to this channel. Thanks so much, Kevin, for having me. And uh, so before we get going, I mean, I'll let you um, introduce, tell people a little bit about uh, what drew you to go to the Redwood Forest and your story is not just about the forest. It's also about forest defense and forest defenders who are there engaged in this activism to protect these trees and uh, connects with deeper and larger issues of the climate. But uh, of course it also relates to, I think it would be fair to say that your, you know, your earlier film where you looked at the, extraction and the exploitation of the environment in West Virginia. Um, and so um, this just seems to be building on that work, which I, I would, I, from watching this film, it seems like this is a really important issue to you as it should be to all people. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I'd say that what I usually, what I usually say about the climate is that it's not an issue um, it is the stage upon which all other issues take place, uh, because obviously if we don't have the ability to survive, then all of the other issues that we fight for and about are meaningless. Um, and so the the fight uh, to protect the redwood forests was an important one, partially because I think it a lot of people, if, if listeners have ever been to the, the Redwoods up in Northern California and into, um, into Oregon, you know that they're, I mean, they're, they're absurdly beautiful and they look like they're from a different planet or from Narnia or something. And so to know that, that it's totally legal to clear cut these forests seems shocking to a lot of people. And it seemed even to me, who was kind of, you know, a grizzled and bitter uh, environmental activist when I found that out. Uh, and so I felt that it was something that needed to be shared. Uh, and who better to share it than people who fight to protect these forests, either through judicial means, through ancestral means in terms of indigenous folks or forest defenders who literally place themselves between the, the trees and the chainsaw. Let's go ahead and show people the trailer that you put together for this, and then everyone will have an idea of uh, both the the beauty and then you know some of the ugliness of this that you present in your uh, movie. So. Uh... All over Northern California, all over the whole Pacific Northwest, like. Thousands and thousands of acres are being clear cut every year. If we don't really do something about what's happening, we might be able to save a few small places here and there, but we can win the battle, but we're going to lose the war unless a whole bunch of people um, get involved and say, like, no more. The people who came to this continent came with a mindset of extraction. I think when places are built with those kinds of mindsets, it doesn't leave a lot of space for something different or more. Unfortunately, only two to 5% of the historic pre-European settlement old growth is, is still remaining. And there is nothing against the law in, in cutting a tree that's you know over a thousand years old. 
we can't protect everything, but we could like, even if we don't, we can't figure out like an overall plan that's going to work, we could like still just keep living in opposition to mm. the extraction that's happening and like fight it in whichever way we can. Because we could still do it if we put our mindset together. I really do. I don't know if we got it in us. Just that, you know, nature bats last and it usually comes up. All right, so that's really well put together. And I think the first thing that really striking is how much has been lost and then also how much we still stand to lose if we don't do anything. I mean, I think it'd be easy to sit back and think that these forest defenders are coming in too late, but also when you look at what is still available to destroy, there's actually a lot to save. So I'm not trying to like glass half full or half empty this, but I'm just basically saying that it's easy to see the history of settler colonialism and think that, you know, we're just always going to be a certain way, but there's also a lot that can still be saved right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is that is that that's something that I'm trying to highlight in the film, uh, as well as what you pointed out, Kevin, about the shift in mindset. I mean, we are uh, well, I, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but <laughs> uh, I myself, I am the descendant of immigrants um, at very recent immigrants. I'm basically first generation. But this settler colonialist mentality exists in the place where I come from, which is Europe. And that was, of course, what was brought to, to, to what is now the United States. And I think there is a lot to be said for shifting our perspective. And that doesn't mean, you know, everybody, oh, get in touch with some indigenous tribe that you're just going to steal their culture. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just in a human way, connecting to nature. And in the film, this is also discussed, like, just go out. You don't have to go to the Redwoods. I mean, yes, they're breathtaking, but there's nature around you wherever you are. <laughs> like, go out into it and feel what that feels like to shift your experience of, oh, this is nature. This is something I go to, and this is something that's other than me. And try shifting it to oh I am part of this and I don't mean that in like a hippy dippy kind of way I mean that in a very real like if we don't understand that we will die kind of way because that is what frames the extractive relationship that we have with nature so there's a lot to be said for before we have a revolution in the streets so to speak we have to have a revolution in our minds um, and that is that that is the precursor to any any kind of defense, whether that be the defense of free press or the defense of nature. And then going about uh, this work and, and deciding to spotlight this group of forest defenders, how do you find these people and what, what drew you to, because there's a lot of different front lines we could say, right? What, what drew you to this battle that, they were waging in the redwood forest yeah so uh, i mean in terms of getting in touch with them I'm, I'm part of a few different environmentalist networks and you know we kind of know a bunch of people so you know the six degrees of separation very much applies in these uh, uh in, in these circles so it wasn't that difficult to reach out to them and uh just i started by interviewing them for for written journalism but then i decided that i wanted to go uh, physically and help. So uh, I, I went in order to film, but also to do some ground support. Uh, and ground support basically means that you're support for the folks in the trees, because it is a pain to have to go up and down the trees constantly. So if they need, if they need something sent up, or if they need to know that, you know, uh, workers are coming, that kind of thing. And so uh, it started with that. And then I just realized that once again, just like with the past film, I had enough footage uh, to really create a film. And I felt that it was important to do that because again, people don't think that this is something that happens. And I think that if we can recognize that, wow, this is what's happening in some of the most gorgeous forests in the world and forests that, by the way, California and the United States as a whole uses as this tourism badge and as this like eco groovy badge, uh, that these are allowed to be clear cut. 
imagine what happens to your place that isn't on the United States postcard or what have you. Um, our ecosystems are being destroyed for the sake of uh, for the sake of a little bit of profit, and that is something that has to be stopped. And and for me personally, I've been doing environmental organizing uh, since I was like thirteen, so that's. Uh, 24 years. So it's been a minute. Um, and it's just always been something that's been very important to me. And, uh, and especially with these places that people don't think are being destroyed, uh, don't think are being uh, that are on the chop block, literally and figuratively. And uh, so you, you don't climb up the trees like the activists. So I did, I did, which is funny because I was also three months pregnant at the time. And the person who was showing me that was like, wow, I've never had someone this tiny or young. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that's cool. A cool feather in your cap. Um, but I will say that I am not meant for that because I am quite afraid of heights and mm. uh, redwoods are massive. So you're 200 feet in the air. So it's not just like a little bit of a climb. It took me 45 minutes to climb up. That's probably not a personal best for anyone, um, but it is terrifying up there. And it took me like 20 minutes just to get up the nerve to step off the platform. So I will from now on be doing ground support because that's just not for me. <laughs> and yeah, so what we're talking about here is the tree sitting that the forest defenders do in case anyone listening into this conversation isn't quite sure um, what we mean by climbing the trees. Uh, but part of that involves constructing platforms. So can you can you say a bit about you know what sort of work goes into making it possible for oh, you're getting into it just a little bit, but but what does it really entail to create that base where uh, you are able to defend a certain part of the forest in in your short film what is clear from the defenders is that they look for parts of the forest that have biodiversity or have a rich array of species that would be worth preserving um, they're trying to not necessarily protect the monoculture that comes after you've degraded and you've done the clear cutting and you're just growing back the forest that in general is going to be exploited again, but they're trying to save some of what is untouched and remains on this land because that is much more precious. And so then they select this area and then can you describe what goes into this defense work? Sure. So a lot of these forests are second growth, uh, since there's only 2% of uh, remaining old growth redwood forests in, in, in the Western United States. Uh, a lot of these are second growth, which means that they've been logged once. And that could be, you know, that could have been 100 years ago, that could have been 70 years ago, 50, whatever. Um, but a lot of these trees are already massive. So my guess is they're 100 plus. Um, and so basically what goes into constructing a so-called tree village uh, is that you have, you, you identify a certain number of trees based on how many people you have that can hold down that tree. Uh, and then you can identify trees around it that don't necessarily need tree sitters, but that can be tied. So this is, this is also what makes tree sitting really great is that you can effectively protect a larger area, even if you don't have a lot of people, which unfortunately is often the case. Uh, so if I was sitting in this redwood over here, I could tie off to several other redwoods, which would mean that they can't cut those down without potentially hurting me, which means that they won't. Uh, and then the next tree sitter could be, you know, uh, 50 yards away in another tree. And so you can basically try to create more of a, a protected area by doing it that way. And then the tree village itself is basically, you know, you've got a few tents set up perhaps that have supplies. Uh, you know, you have uh, you have a walkie talkie system and things like that. Uh, you have uh, people who come in. This was also something that I helped do since I was coming in from the outside. You have people who bring in supplies, whether that be rope or groceries or things like that. And then people who are leaving take out trash. And so you have this cycle 
uh, that continuously connects the tree sitters to the quote unquote outside world, uh, but that makes sure that the tree sitters have what they need. And also uh, you make sure that you have recon around the area so that if somebody were to come with a chainsaw, then the tree sitters have enough of a heads up uh, to effectively prepare for that situation. All right. So not to necessarily upstage uh, your work in this film, but I think to like, connect it and show just how relevant it is. Many people are gaining a familiarity with this kind of uh, forest defense work because of what they've observed with the movement in Atlanta to stop Cop City, which as we're talking today, we have news breaking that 60 activists have been indicted under the racketeering or, or under RICO the same way that Donald Trump was indicted, although there are actually vastly different charges and much like Donald Trump's indicted under the Espionage Act and so is Julian Assange. That's about all you can say as far as the similarities. And then they completely diverge. So, you know, we won't be talking about Donald Trump. I'm just giving people a reference point to say that it's escalated significantly and an alarmingly uh, you have um, indictments coming that say that, well, first, they're going to criminalize this movement by trying to link it to George Floyd, uh, the date that he was murdered. So there's the blatant racism of it all, which is, I suppose, not the first and foremost thing you think about when you're discussing the environment, although you do have the you know, the eradication of, of, of species and in uh, the, the, the genocide of indigenous people. And that's wrapped up in that ideology. Um, but that said, um, you, you also have the fact that there's a section of the indictment that particularly goes after mutual aid work, particularly goes after um, the, the, what they try to marginalize or criminalize as some kind of like anarchist philosophy to try and help other people uh and we we have seen that from time to time and you know they go out there groups like food not bombs that want to feed the homeless uh but uh they they they're really escalating and you know I'll let you get in and give your reaction to this and I and connect it back to your film but as I'm considering the indictments and this stop cop city movement alongside the important work of these forest defenders that are fighting clear cutting of the timber forest in California. What really stands out to me here is in, in California, we're talking about an extractive industry that's removing logs that will possibly be used to produce products that everyone can consume. In Georgia, we're talking about just wiping out forests so that the cops and um, more militarized policing elements can have a compound in which to train. So while I'm not excusing it, I'm saying that in California, there's something about us as consumers that we have to face. In Georgia, we don't have to do this at all. We don't have to give people a playground to play out their militaristic cop fantasies, but that seems to be the fight that we're having in Georgia. Well, Kevin, I do think it I think I think it depends on the perspective, right? Because if you ask people about Cop City who are ignorant of the the paradigm that you just shared, they'd be like, well, we need to make sure that our cops are prepared. So then there is something that has to be confronted. It is your perspective on the police state. Uh, and so I think that, yes, it's the in, in California, you have to confront consumerism. But in, in my opinion, it's even easier because do you really need to cut down a 2000 year old tree to make a deck? Like when you put it that way, it's like, well, no, what kind of monster would say yes to that? And of course, that applies uh, in Atlanta, too. What kind of monster would say, yes, I absolutely think that there needs to be this, this endeavor. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is uh, th this kind of attack on, uh, on, on folks who 
uh, who want to protect their home place and make sure that communities are cared for and not targeted by police violence. That has a long and rich history in the United States. And it's not surprising that they're using any kind of anarchist labeling, because even though it is technically legal to be an anarchist in the United States, <laughs> um, the, the history of the government going after anarchists in a very strong uh, and, and antagonistic way is, is, is very well documented. I mean, we just had, quote unquote, Labor Day in the United States, but it's not actually Labor Day because that's May 1st, the anniversary of the Haymarket affair. Uh, but we don't celebrate that in the United States. It's officially Law Day because we can't possibly have a memory of an anarchist and communist and socialist uprising. That would be horrific if you knew that you could just light things on fire and just go on a massive strike, hundreds of thousands of people. We can't teach kids that. So I think that there's a there's a long and rich history of going after people who have any kind of semblance of that kind of ideology or that goal. Uh, and the same thing goes for folks uh, who are forest defenders. I mean, we see people continuously thrown, uh, I mean, more than having the book thrown at them. This is restructuring of the entire legal system so that these people will be targeted in vicious ways. Uh, and, uh, and while we're not seeing that necessarily with the folks that I I interviewed, they are not, uh, thankfully at the moment, uh, in jail or anything like that. This is something that we see on the front lines of the environmental fight wh wherever it happens. Uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised to see this kind of uh, thing happen in Northern California. So that's why I also feel a diversity of tactics is important because not everyone can uh, or is willing to throw down in that particular way. So a diversity of tactics uh, is important to highlight that everybody can be a part of these fights. One of the things that comes through in your film is that uh, the, the systems that we have are not enough to save us. And so part of what I see your film doing that is valuable is inviting us to imagine how we could take a different path, which is usually like the role of the artist is to force us to imagine that there could be a different way. So when you speak to somebody who says that the law isn't going to be able to stop people from tearing down this forest, and it's also not even certain that these forest defenders have the numbers in order to stop it, uh, well, then at least you have to start somewhere in order to get people engaged. I'm wondering what you think about... Uh, what forest defense work represents in the sense that it gives people something really tangible that they could dig into. Um, I just think of like, there's a lot of aspects to the climate emergency for lack of a better term. I'll go ahead and just put it that way. And when you're looking at the degradation throughout, I'll take the United States for now, just because that's where, we are as sit that we're citizens of the United States. And I think that's the stewardship that we should have for our environment should begin first here where we actually live at home. Uh, when you, when you look at this, you can do something. So it's like when you, when you think of all the different headlines that are almost demobilizing, cause you don't really know what you can do as you see record breaking heat or you, you read about, wildfires or whatever uh but it what i like about your movie is that it suggests to people that there's an immediate surrounding that you can go to and protect right away you don't have to wait for anybody to give you um, an invitation it's like right there for you to go out and try and save before it's gone yeah, absolutely. And kind of circling back to, to Stop Cop City, when I spoke with, uh, with friends and organizers down there, one of the things that I thought was so cool is that they had events in the forest. You know, they had like, we're going to go uh, foraging and we're going to have a concert and we're going to, uh, there's childcare in the forest and they made the forest a home for the community. And in that way, you don't have to suggest kind of um, abstractly to people that nature is something to protect. 
because you're standing in it. And now it's a cool place for you to hang out. It is like your living room. And so I think that that's, that's part of it is that go outside wherever you live and find that, you know, outdoor living room, whether that be by a lake or, uh, you know, some woods or a, a field, like whatever it is, and then start interacting with it in that way. Like find out what, uh, what what native plants, uh, what native animals are part of this ecosystem. And in that way, you create that relationship that we are, again, a part of, uh, not a part, but a part of. And you inevitably have that feeling that, oh, well, if something were to threaten this, I would want to defend it. Because you then have that relationship, that mutualistic relationship, just like Kropotkin wrote about in Mutual Aid, you have that relationship with your home place. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's another thing to really highlight is that I think a lot of times we, you know, the climate emergency, as you put it, feels so heavy and uh, the, the, the needs and the demands of defending, how do I defend an Amazon rainforest? That's just so, it's too big. And I think part of it starts with not just the home place, but enjoying it and and highlighting the importance of joy and relationship building as opposed to, oh, I got to go defend this lake. I mean, who cares? I don't even like this lake. Like, that's not how we should be, uh, you know, approaching this. It should be about like, hey, we're going to do something fun out here. And then that is part of your uh, like your extended family. Again, I'm not trying to sound hippy dippy, uh, which I think is also very telling that anytime somebody talks about nature in that way, it's like, oh, what a you know tree hugging hippie. Uh, when in reality, that's like scientifically speaking, we are part of nature. So I think that that kind of paradigm shift and that way of being in nature is something fun as opposed to like, oh, I got to go protect this. Uh, that's really important too. Well, I really appreciate what um, what what you've put together here with this film. And uh, why don't you take a moment and tell people where they can find it and how they can support this work that you have done? Sure. Uh, thanks, Kevin. So folks can check out the trailer and more information and also get the film at tothetreesfilm.com. And all of my other work, including my music, my poetry, my, my articles, you can find at artkillingapathy.com. Oops, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do there. Um, I was going to put <laughs> your uh, film up on the screen here. But also check out The Dissenter because that's really cool. Yeah, well, I'm just like, <laughs> stepping on your plug, which I was supposed to set up there. But there, people can find the film over and, and do support it. Um, it's, it's independent filmmaking, which I think most people claim to support, at least if they don't like the, the, the corporate um, cookie cutter churned out movies. They claim most people claim to like independent films. So this is a person who has actually put together an independent film and I'm very happy to be able to support that work. So thank you, Eleanor. Thanks so much, Kevin. Appreciate it.